Espacifismo, Anarchist Organization, Historical Perspectives, and Influences. Since the term Especifismo arrived in Brazil in the mid-1990s, there has been a series of polemics or even confusions around it. There were, and unfortunately still are, people who say that Especifismo is not anarchism. They accuse Especifista anarch organizations of being political parties, among other absurdities. When we identify the FARG as a specific anarchist organization, we are seeking more than anything else to locate within the discussion about anarchist organization what the positions that we espouse are. The term Especifismo was created by the Uruguayan Anarchist Federation, Federación Anarquista Uruguaya, FAO, and by it we refer to a conception of anarchist organization that has two fundamental axes, organization and social work slash insertion. These two axes are based on the classical concepts, the classical concepts of differentiated situation of anarchism in the social and political levels, the Kuninist concept, and specific anarchist organization, Malatestan concept. Therefore, the term especifismo, besides having been recently conceived, refers to anarchist organizational practices that have existed since the 19th century. In addition to these two axes, there is a series of other organizational questions that are defined within especifismo and that we seek to develop next. Therefore, the two main classical references of especifismo are Bakunin and Malatesta. This does not mean that we disregard other important theorists, such as Proudhon and Kropotkin. We have used many of their theoretical references in this text, but we believe that, for the discussion on anarchist organization, Bakunin and Malatesta have proposals more suitable for our work. In the following paragraphs, we intend to briefly resume some discussions that we've had throughout this text and especially this last chapter, and locate them and compare them with other positions that exist within anarchism. We believe that more than affirming the positions we advocate, what we've done so far, it is fitting to realize a few fraternal critiques of other conceptions of organization or disorganization present within anarchism and, based on a few selected points, to compare our conceptions with others. Perhaps the best contrast with the Especifista model of organization would be what we call the synthesis model, or synthesism. This model was theoretically formalized in two homonymous documents called the Anarchist Synthesis, one by Sebastian Fuhr and the other by Violin. Historically and globally, it was the platform of Dielo Truda that established this contrast. We intend to resume part of this debate about anarchist organization, although in our view, especifismo is broader than platformism, even though it, the latter, possesses a significant influence. Synthesis advocates a model of anarchist organization in which all the anarchists, anarcho-communists, anarcho-syndicalists, anarcho-individualists, etc., and therefore, it presents many of the characteristics that we criticize below. We know that some of these characteristics are not necessarily linked to the synthesis model of organization. However, it is undeniable that many of them are reproduced in organizations of this type, primarily through the influence of individualism, but not only this. We recognize that within synthesis organizations, there are also serious militants committed to social anarchism, and therefore we do not want to critis the criticism to seem generalized. Although we never question whether these organizations are anarchist, for us they all are, they do not in most cases converge with our way of conceiving anarchist organization. First of all, when dealing in this text with the specific anarchist organization, from this perspective, particular perspective, we are not speaking about any anarchist organization. There are diverse anarchist organizations that are not a specifista. 
Therefore, especifismo implies much more than to advocate anarchist organization. The first difference is in the way of understanding anarchism itself. As we noted at the beginning of this text, we understand anarchism as an ideology. That is, a set of ideas, motivations, aspirations, values, a structure or system of concepts that have a direct connection with action, that which we call political practice. In this case, we seek to differentiate this understanding of anarchism from another purely abstract and theoretical, which only encourages free thinking, without necessarily conceiving a model of social transformation. Anarchism thought of only from this model of critical observation of life offers an aesthetic freedom and endless possibilities. However, if so conceived, it does not offer real possibilities of social transformation, since it is not put into practice, into action. It does not have the political practice that seeks the final objectives. Especifismo advocates an anarchism that, as an ideology, seeks to conceive a model of performance that transforms the society of today into libertarian socialism by means of the so social revolution. This process necessarily involves the organization of the exploited classes into a popular organization and demands the use of violence understood primarily as a response to the violence of the current system. Other anarchist currents are against violence and believe that social transformation can take place in other ways. Another difference is around the very question of organization. For us, organization is an absolutely central question when dealing with anarchism. Without it, we believe it to be impossible to conceive any serious political project which has the objective of arriving at the social revolution and libertarian socialism. There are anarchist currents that support anti-organizational or even spontaneous positions and believe that any form of organization is authoritarian or averse to anarchism. For these currents, the formation of a desk to co coordinate an assembly is authoritarian. Anyway, for these anarchists, the struggle must take place spontaneously. The gains, if they come, must come spontaneously. The connection between struggles must be spontaneous. And even capitalism and the state, if overthrown, would be done so by a spontaneous mobilization. Perhaps, even after an eventual social revolution, things will evolve on their own, falling into place effortlessly. These anarchists believe that prior organization is not necessary. Others think that it is not even desirable. Some anarchist individuals that defend these points of view and who are willing to do social work cannot deal with the authoritarian forces and, without the proper organization, end up being laborers and sleeves for authoritarian projects or they leave frustrated because they cannot obtain space in social movements. We noted earlier that we conceive of the specific anarchist organization as an organization of active minority. Thus, it is an organization of anarchists that group themselves together at the political and ideological level, and that carry out their main activity on the social level, which is broader, aiming to be the ferment of struggle. In the Especifista model, there is necessarily this differentiation between the political and the social levels of activity. Differently, there are anarchists who conceive of the anarchist organization as a broad grouping that federates all those who call themselves anarchists, serving as a convergent space for the realization of actions with complete autonomy. In anarchism, broadly speaking, this division between the social and political levels is also not accepted by all the currents, which understand the anarchist organization in a diffuse manner. It being able to be a social movement, an organization, an affinity group, a study group, a community, a cooperative, etc. Even the concept of anarcho-syndicalism at various times sought to suppress the difference between levels of activity, blending anarchist ideology with trade unionism. 
These and other attempts to ideolo ideologize social movements in our understanding weaken both the social movements, which no longer operate around concrete issues like land, housing, employment, etc., as well as anarchism itself, since it does not allow for the deepening of ideological struggles, which occur in the midst of the social movement. It also weakens, since the goal of these anarchists to turn all the militants of the social movement into anarchists is impossible, unless they significantly reduce and weaken the movements. In this way, or even on seeing that it is natural to find people of different ideologies and social movements that will never be anarchists, these anarchists get frustrated and often shy away from struggles. As a consequence of this, anarchism is often confined to itself. The anarchist organization of active minority is often understood by other anarchist currents as similar to authoritarian vanguard op organization. As we have made sure to point out, when we conceive this separation between the social and political level, we do not mean to say that this say by this that we wish to be in front of the social movements, nor that the political level has any hierarchy or domination in relation to the social level. There is also a difference in relation to the preferred space for the practice of anarchism. We, as specifistas, believe that this space is the class struggle, primarily because we consider that we live not only in a society, but in a class society. Regardless of how we think of the differences of these classes, it seems impossible to us to deny that domination and exploitation take place at different levels in our society, and that the economic factor has a lot of influence on this. For us, anarchism was born among the people, and that's where it should be, taking a clear position in favor of the exploited classes that are in permanent conflict in, this, in the class struggle. Therefore, when we talk about where to sow the seeds of anarchism, for us, it is clear that it, is, it has to be within the class struggle, in the spaces in which the contradictions of capitalism are most evident. There are anarchists that do not support this class struggle bias of anarchism, and what is worse, there are those that accuse it of being assin assist assistentialist or of wanting to apologize for the poor. Denying the class struggle, most of these anarchists believe that as the classic definition of bourgeois and proletarian classes does not take today's society into account, then one could say that these classes no longer exist, or that this would be an anachronistic concept. We fundamentally disagree with these positions and believe that regardless of how we define classes, whatever we put more or less emphasis on the, whether we put more or less emphasis on the economic character, etc., it is undeniable that there are contexts and circumstances in which people suffer more from the efforts from the effects of capitalism. And it is in these contexts that these circumstances that we want to prioritize our work. When we seek to apply anarchism to the class struggle, we assert what we call social work, and which we defined earlier as the activity that the anarchist organization performs in the midst of the class struggle causing anarchism to interact with the exploited classes. As we also said, for us, this should be the main activity of the specific anarchist organization. We argue that through social work, the anarchist organization should seek social insertion, the process of influencing social movements through anarchist practice. There are anarchists who do not defend this work with a view to social insertion. Part do not believe that it is a priority, and the other part, which is more complicated, believe that it is authoritarian. For anarchists who think that social work or insertion is not a priority, it seems that other activities would be more effective in the development of anarchism. However, it is often not stated. Besides, at least apparently, not having a strategic formulation what happens in practice 
is that these anarchists seek to work with propaganda, very restricted to publications, events, and culture. As we have already emphasized, this propaganda is already this propaganda is also central for us, but it is not enough if done without the backing of social work and insertion. With this support, propaganda is much more effective. Therefore, propaganda in especificismo should be performed with these two biases, educational slash cultural and struggle with social movements. Anarchists who do not believe that social work or insertion are nor should be a priority, prefer to work in other mediums, far away from the class struggle, from social movements, from people of different ideologies. Some say that as members of society, they already have social insertion. Often, they become sectarian, managing to get along only with their peers and ghettoizing anarchism. This explains the sectarianism of some anarchists which occurs in much smaller proportion with specific organizations. Much more complicated than the above position is the position advocated by anarchists that are against social work and insertion. These anarchists believe that as they are often not poor, as they are often not in social movements, they are not landless, for example, it is authoritarian to work with a poor community or even with social movements since they are from outside this reality. For them, it is authoritarian for a person who has somewhere to live to support the struggle of the homeless. It is authoritarian to frequent a community movement without being from the community. It is authoritarian to support the waste pickers struggle if you are not one of them. For these anarchists, there is only legitimacy in working with popular movements if you are a popular and if you are part of this reality of the movement. As these anarchists are generally not in these conditions, they do not approximate themselves to social movements, nor to the class struggle. They end up making of their anarchism a movement in itself, which is characterized by being essentially of the middle class and intellectuals, by not seeking contact with social and popular struggles, by not being in contact with people of different ideology. Indeed, this anarchism of the intellectual and middle class, when not seeking social work and insertion, necessarily ends up in one of two ways. Either it abandons the proposal of so for social transformation or constitutes itself into a group that fights for the people, not with the pe that fights for the people, not with the people assuming the position of vanguard and not of active minority. Social work for these militants is often compared to the entryism of the authoritarian left, people that enter into social movements to make them work for their favor. In most cases, they advocate spontaneity, since to come from outside, to put anarchism within social movements is authoritarian. According to them, ideas should arise spontaneously. They denounce discussion, persuasion, convincing, exchange, influence as external to social movements and therefore authoritarian. We as specifistas also radically disagree with this position against social work and insertion. As we explained, for us, anarchism should not be confined to itself nor shy away from social movements and people of different ideologies. It should serve as a tool, like yeast, as the engine of the struggle of our time. For this, anarchism, instead of hiding, should confront reality and seek to transform it. For this transformation, it is useless to preach to the converted. We have necessarily to interact with non-anarchists. Since we understand that class is not defined by origin, but by the position that you advocate in the struggle, we believe that to support social movements, to assist mobilizations and organizations different to the reality in which you are included, is an ethical obligation for any militant committed to the end of class society. Finally, we believe that social work brings necess necessary practice to anarchism 
which has an immense contribution in the development of the theoretical and ideological line of the organization. This activity is for us extremely important in our theoretical development, since it means that we theorize while having knowledge of reality and the practical application of anarchism in struggles. Groups and organizations that do not have social work tend to radicalize a discourse that does not have support in practice. When this happens, the tendency is for an ultra-radical and revolutionary discourse to exist, often accusing others of being reformists, etc., but that does not go beyond theory. As we have seen, in a specifismo, there is ideological and theoretical unity, an alignment in relation to the theoretical and ideological aspects of anarchism. This political line is collectively constructed and everyone in the organization is obliged to follow it. Because we consider anarchism something very broad with very different or even contradictory positions, it appears necessary to us that between all of these positions, we must extract an ideological and theoretical line to be advocated and developed by the organization. As we have emphasized, this line must necessarily be linked to practice, since we believe that to theorize effectively is essentially to act. For anarchists that do not advocate this unity, the anarchist organization could work with different ideological and theoretical lines. Each anarchist or group of anarchists may have their interpretation of anarchism and their own theory. This is motive for various conflicts and splits in organizations with this conception. As there is no agreement on initial questions, the fights are frequent as some think that anarchists, that anarchists should do work with social movements Others find this authoritarian and a Marxist thing. Some think that the function of anarchism is to enhance the ego of individuals. Others are radically against this, and so on. For us, there is no way to have an effective practice or even constitute an organization without agreeing on some initial questions. In organizations that do not work with ideological and theoretical unity, there is no development in this direction, since with so many problems on the simplest questions, the most complex don't even come to be discussed. Bakunin was right when he said, quote, who embraces much tightens little, end quote. It is important, quote, to understand that the division that exists between anarchists on this point is much deeper than is commonly believed and that it equally implies an irreconcilable theoretical disagreement. I say, to this to I say this to respond to my good friends who, favoring an agreement at any price, claim we should not create problems of method. The idea is one alone and the goal is the same. We therefore remain united without being torn apart by a small disagreement over tactics. I, on the contrary, realized long ago that we are torn apart precisely because we are very close, because we are artificially close. Under the apparent veneer of the community of three or four ideas, abolition of the state, abolition of private property, revolution, anti-parliamentarianism, there's an enormous difference in the conception of each one of these theoretical statements. The difference is so great that it prevents us from taking the same path without prosecuting us and without reciprocally neutralizing our work. Or, if we wanted to, remaining in peace without renouncing what we believe to be true. I repeat, there is not only a difference of method, but a big difference of ideas. Besides ideological and theoretical unity, Especifistas advocates strategic and tactical unity. To act with strategy, as we have seen, implies taking into account a plan of all the practical actions performed by the organization, seeking to verify where you are, where you want to go, and how. 
Anarchism that works with strategic and tactical unity makes of, of planning and its alignment in practical application a strong organizational pillar. This because we believe that lack of strategy disperses efforts, causing many of them to be lost. We advocate a model in which a way forward is collectively discussed, and together with this path, we have established priorities and responsibilities assigned to militants. The priorities and responsibilities mean that everyone is not going to be able to do what passes through their head whenever they want. Each one will have an obligation to the organization to accomplish that which they undertook and that which was defined as a priority. Obviously, we seek to reconcile the activities that each one likes to do with the priorities set by the organization. But we don't always have to do only what we like to do. An especifista model implies that we have to do things that we don't like very much or to cease doing some things that we like a lot. This is to ensure that the organization proceeds with strategy, with everyone rowing the boat in the same direction. We criticize with emphasis organizations that do not work with strategy. For us, it is not possible to work in an organization in which each militant or group does what they think best or simply that which they like to do, believing themselves to be contributing to a common whole. Generally, when anarchists of, this, of all types are grouped in an organization without having strategic affinities, there's no agreement on how to act. That is, it is not possible to establish a way of proceeding, and there is only one agreement, that things must keep going. How do you conceive an organization in which you seek to reconcile a group that believes it should act as a specific organization in a social movement with a group that thinks that the priority should be social interaction among friends, group therapy, or even the exaltation of the individual, considering work with social movements as authoritarian, or even Marxist or assistentialist? There are two ways of managing these differences. Either you discuss the issues and live between fights and stress which consume and live between fights and stress which consume a large part of the time, or you simply do not touch on the issues. Most organizations of this type opt for the second form. Quote, in order to establish a degree of coordination in action, necessary to coordination, I believe, among people who tend toward the same goal, certain conditions are imposed. A number of rules linking each one to all, 
certain frequently revised parts and agreements, pacts and agreements. If missing all this, if each one works as they please, the more serious people will find themselves in a situation where the efforts of some will be neutralized by those of others. From this will result disharmony, and not the harmony and serene confidence to which we tend. Ideological and theoretical unity and strategic and tactical unity are attained through the collective decision-making process adopted by specific organizations, which is an attempt at consensus and, if this is not possible, the vote, the majority winning. As we have also emphasized in this case, the whole organization adopts the winning decision. Differently, there are organizations that only work with consensus often allowing one or other person to have an exacerbated influence on a decision-making process that involves a much larger number of people. Seeking consensus at any cost and afraid of splitting these organizations allow for one or another person to have a disproportionate weight in decisions only in order to achieve consensus. Other times, they spend hours on discussion of little importance only to seek consensus. We have in mind that the decision-making process is a means and not an end in itself. The obligation every, of everyone to follow the same path, which is a rule in a specifismo, is a commitment that the organization has to its strategy because if every time a decision taken does not please some of the militants and this party refuses to perform the work, it will be impossible for the organization to move forward. In the case of voting, it is important to bear in mind that at one time, some will win the vote and work on their proposal. At another time, they will lose and work on the proposal of other comrades. With this form of decision-making, it gives more importance to collective deliberations than to individual points of view. There is a difference, even, on the central points that favor the specific organization. The commitment, responsibility, and self-discipline of militants within the organization. In the Especifista model, there is a high level of militant commitment. Thus, it is essential that the militants assume commitments before the organization and implement them. Militant commitment imprints a link between militant and organization, which is a mutual relationship in which the organization is responsible for the militant as well as the, as the militant being responsible for the organization. As well as the organization owing satisfaction to the militant, the militant owes satisfaction to the organization. Lack of commitment, responsibility, and self-discipline constitutes a major problem in many anarchist groups and organizations. It is very common for people to come together and to more or less participate in activities, doing only that which interests them, often participating in decisions, assuming commitments, and not fulfilling them, or simply not assuming commitments. There are lots of organizations that are compliant with this lack of militant commitment. It is undeniable that, for this reason, these organizations are cooler to be part of. However, they are not very effective from a militant point of view, as militancy for us is something necessary in the struggle for a free and egalitarian society. We do not believe that it will always be cool we have, if we had to choose between a more effective model of militancy and another more cool, we would have to opt for effectiveness. For work with militant commitment, Especifismo maintains an organization with levels of commitment. As we have explained, we advocate the logic of concentric circles in which all militants have a well-defined space in the organization a space which is determined by the level of commitment that the militant wants to assume. The more they want to commit themselves, the more inside the organization they will be, and the greater will be their deliberating power. Therefore, 
both at the political level as well as the social level, there are well-defined entrance criteria. From the instances of supporter or groupings of tendency to the specific anarchist organization. Only militants with ideological affinity with the organization are inside the specific anarchist organization. Contrary to the Especifista model, there are other organizations whose only criteria for the entrance of militants is their definition as anarchists, regardless of what conception of anarchism they have. Some people participate a bit in the organization. Others are more committed. Some assume more responsibilities than others, and all have the same power to, of deliberation. Thus, many deliberate on activities that they are not going to perform. That is, they determine what others will do. When an organization allows for someone to deliberate something and not assume responsibilities, or that they assume responsibilities and do not meet them it allows for the, an authoritarianism of those who deliberate and put work on the backs of other comrades. Finally, in this other model, each one involves themselves in the way they perceive best, appearing when they think they should, and there is little emphasis on the question of militant commitment. Many, when they are questioned, claim themselves victims of authoritarianism. As we have explained, for, the, for us, this model of organization, besides overloading the more responsible militants, ends up by allowing this discrepancy of people who do not deliberate and work in the same proportion. Therefore, we do not want to be this great umbrella that covers all types of anarchists. These broad indefinitions apparently group more anarchists in the organization. However, we believe that we should not opt for the criterion of quantity, but the quality of militants. Quote, there is no doubt that if we avoid properly specifying our true character, the number of our adherents could become greater. It is evident, on the other hand, that if we proclaim loudly our principles, the number of our adherents will be less, but at least they will be serious adherents on whom we can count." End quote. A relevant difference also occurs around the issue of anarchist individualism. Especifismo means a complete and absolute rejection of an anarchist individualism. For this reason, it differs from other organizations that are willing to work with individualists. For us, there are two types of individualists in anarchism. One type, which was more common in the past, of people that prefer to work alone, but that have in mind the same project as us. In these people, we only have to criticize the fact that, being disorganized, they cannot potentialize the results of their work. Another type, more, evident, more in evidence today, renounces the socialist project. Based on the anarchist critique of the state, they have little critique of capitalism, and no activity in the direction of socially transforming the reality in which we live, putting themselves in the condition of simple critical observers of society. They construct an anarchism from secondary thinkers and references, simply around criticism. They don't have any societal project, much less coherent action that points toward this new society. We might ask, quote, what then remains for us of anarchist individualism? The denial of class struggle, the denial of the principle of an anarchist organization, whose purpose is the free society of equal workers, and even more, empty quackery encouraging workers unhappy with their existence to take part by resorting to personal solutions, supposedly open to them as liberated individuals." End quote. Thus, they exacerbate the role of individual freedom, which, removed from collective freedom, becomes merely an egotistical pleasure, for the death of a few who, who can, through their privileges within capitalism, afford it. In reality, individual freedom can only exist in collective freedom, for the slavery of others limits the freedom of each, 
then full individual freedom can only be realized at the moment in which collectively all are free. We agree with Bakunin when he said, quote, I can only consider and feel myself free in the presence and in relation to other men. I am only truly free when all human beings around me, men and women, are equally free. The other's freedom, far from being a limitation or denial of my freedom, is, on the contrary, its necessary condition and confirmation. Only the freedom of others makes me truly free in such a way that the more numerous are the free men that surround me and the more extensive and broad their freedom, the greater and deeper will become my freedom, my personal freedom thus confirmed by the freedom of all extends to infinity. For us, it is impossible to seek individual freedom in a society like ours in which millions do not have access to the most basic necessities of human being. One cannot think of a purely individual anarchism as a way of positioning yourself in the world, of having a different lifestyle. For individualists, in most cases, to be an anarchist means to be an artist, a bohemian, to promote the sexual freedom and of having open relationships or with more than one partner, to wear different clothes, to have a radical haircut, to behave extravagantly, to eat different foods, to define yourself personally, to fulfill yourself personally, to be against revolution, to be against socialism, to have a discourse without rhyme or reason, enjoying the freedom of aesthetics. In short, becoming apolitical. We disagree fundamentally with this position and believe that the influences in the in this direction are disastrous to anarchism, deterring serious and committed militants. Finally, we agree with Malatesta when he stressed, quote, it is true we would like all of us to be in agreement and to unite into a single powerful beam all the forces of anarchism, but we do not believe in the, in the soundness of organizations made by the force of concessions and restrictions, where there is no real sympathy and agreement among members. It is better to be disunited than badly united." End quote. For us, choosing the most appropriate model of anarchist organization is crucial, is crucial so that we have the most appropriate means, consistent with the ends we seek to achieve. If we advocate a specifismo, which is a form of anarchist organization, it is because we believe that it is today more suitable for the work we intend to perform. We understand that there are anarchists who do not agree with a specifismo, and we do not think that they are less anarchist because of it. We only demand respect for our choice, such as we respect those who have made other choices. We now turn briefly to a specifismo's historical perspective and influences. As we have seen, the term especifismo was developed by the FAO and only arrived in Brazil in the late 20th century. Nevertheless, this term, more than creating a new conception of anarchist organization, sought to group a series of already existing anarchist organizational conceptions, which took shape starting from the 19th century. The especifismo of the FAO asserts the influence of Bakunin and Malatesta, of the class struggle of anarcho-syndicalism, of expropriator anarchism, all this within a Latin American context. We will attempt to explain in the following paragraphs from our own conception, how we understand the historic experience of especifismo, the main past experiences in terms of anarchist organization, which influence us today. Especifismo's first historic reference is Bakunin, from the organizational conceptions that constituted the activity of the libertarians within the International Workers Association, IWA, and which gave body to anarchism. The IWA was articulated from the visits of the representatives of the French Workers Associations of, to England, 
where they contracted English and exiled German Union leaders, amongst the latter Karl Marx. Politically, the composition of the IWA appeared heterogeneous. Marxists, Blancists, Republicans, trade unionists, Proudhonian federalists. The Marxists ended up by forming a majority in decision-making in the Central Committee, aligning themselves with members of other currents and taking control of that body. This situation persisted even after the substitution of the Central Committee by the General Council in the 1866 Geneva Congress. There one, there one saw that the anarchists, be they inspired by Proudhon or followers of Bakunin, did not have any force in the central executive of the association. They were more influential through the grassroots, showing this in the Congresses. Two tendencies developed within the IWA, one centralist and one federalist. Among the authoritarian centralists stood out the communists, theoretically and politically guided by Marx, who counted on the IWA as an instrument to bring the proletariat into political power. They sought to constitute a workers' state apparatus for the transformation of capitalist society into communism through an intermediate period of reorganization, necessarily to be undertaken under a dictatorship. Among the libertarian federalists were the anarchists, who advocated social revolution with the immediate abolition of all bodies of authority and the formation of a new society based on the free and federative organization of workers, according to their occupations, problems, and interests. This basic divergence had been present from the beginning and was already clearly visible at the Geneva Congress the first plenary meeting of the International. Against the authoritarians were the Proudhonian mutualists, who led the debate supported by collectivists that already belonged to the IWA before Bakunin had affiliated himself to it. In the Lausanne in 1867 and Brussels 1868 Congresses, collectivism had rapidly come to gain ground in relation to mutualism. And in Basel, 1869, the collectivist attendance was in strong predominance among those averse to authority and strengthened by the presence of Bakunin. In the competing camp, Marx, while avoiding to make personal commitment in the Congress, made his interventions through programs, reports, newsletters, and proposals of the Council. In Basel, Bakunin presented a proposal against the right of inheritance. Marx opposed him, but the proposal was approved. Still, in the context of the IWA, Bakunin, together with other anarchist militants, formed the Alliance of Socialist Dem Democracy, which would be accepted as a section of the IWA in 1869. We understand the Alliance as a specific anarchist organization on the political level, that operated within the IWA on the social level. The Alliance was an organization of active minority composed of the most secure, most dedicated, most intelligent, and most energetic members in a word by the closest. It was formed to act secretly in order to address the issue that one could not publicly address and to act as a catalyst in the labor movement. The alliance defined the relation between the social and the political levels, quote, the alliance is the necessary complement of the international, but the international and the alliance, while tending towards the same final objective, pursue different goals at the same time. One has as its mission to unite the laboring masses the millions of workers across the differences of nations and countries, across the borders of all states, into one immense and compact body. The other, the Alliance, has as its mission to give to the masses a truly revolutionary direction, the programs of the one and the other without being opposites at all are different by the degree of their respective development. 
That of the international, if we take it seriously, is also a germ, but only in germ the whole program of the alliance. The program of the alliance is the ultimate explanation of the program of the international. The practice of the alliance within the IWA caused the authoritarian tendency to seek to isolate and discredit the practice of the libertarians. After the Basel Congress, attacks on the collectivist group intensified. In 1870, Marx directed two private communications of the General Council to the IWA sections, with severe criticisms of the Bakuninist positions. With this, he prepared the climate for the London Conference of the following year, during which the Marxist group attempted to impose the doctrine of the conquest of state power, and for the Hague Congress of 1872. In this plenary, in this plenary he urged for the expulsion of Bakunin from the IWA, which he obtained. By 1874, the international was defunct. The second historical reference of Especifismo is Malatesta, a militant who came to join the Bakuninist alliance and who was a representative of the organizationalist current of anarchist communism. Following the collectivist tradition of the anarchism of Bakunin's time, which advocated in the future society distribution to each according to their work, was born the anarchist communist current which has since then advocated distribution to each according to their needs. Malatesta was characterized by defending, within this current, positions against evolutionism and scientism, present in a large part of the socialist movement. For Malatesta, the future would not be necessarily determined and could only be modified by will, by a voluntarist intervention in events in order to provide the desired social transformation. Outspoken critic of individualism, Malatesta advocated an anarchism based completely on organization, an anarchism that we could call organizationalist, and that, like the anarchism of Bakunin, maintained a distinct role at the social and political level. At the political level, Malatesta developed his conception of the specific anarchist organization, which he called the Anarchist Party. By anarchist party, we understand all those who want to contribute to achieving anarchy and that consequently they need to set an objective to be achieved and a road to travel. This organization should act in the so-called mass movements of the time and influence them as much as possible. And the unions were the preferred terrain chosen for anarchist activity. Malatesta clearly pointed out the difference between the political level of anarchism and the social level, the space of insertion which was con constituted at the time by syndicalism. Quote, in my opinion, the labor movement is no more than a means, Through their, though there is no doubt that it is the best means we have, but I refuse to accept this means as an end. Syndicalists, on the other hand, have a certain propensity to transform the means into ends and consider the parts as a whole. And in this way, for some of us, syndicalism begins to be transformed into a new doctrine that threatens the very existence of anarchism. I lamented in the past that comrades isolated themselves from the labor movement. I lament today that at the other extreme, Many of us allow ourselves to be swallowed by the same movement. Once again, the organization of the working class, the strike, direct action, boycott, sabotage, and armed insurrection itself are only the means. Anarchy is the end. End quote. Advocating an anarchism that seeks social transformation from will, Malatesta believed, as we believe today, the specific anarchist organization should act within the class struggle, in the midst of the social movements, and, with them, reach the social revolution and libertarian socialism, which he called anarchy. For this, Malatesta sought to create both specific anarchist organizations, as in the case of the Italian Anarchist Revolutionary Socialist Party, and the Italian Anarchist Union. 
as well as organizations that acted at the social level, as in the cases of the Italian Syndical Union, the Labor Alliance, and the Unions of Argentina. The positions of Malatesta were widely disseminated by Luigi Fabri, another Italian anarchist communist, who also made significant contribution to Espacifismo. An important experience for Espacifismo in our conception was also that of Magonismo in the radical phase of the Mexican Liberal Party, PLM. Ricardo Flores Magón, its most active militant, joined the PLM in 1901, it having been founded a year earlier. During the Porfirio Diaz dictatorship, both the PLM and the journal Regeneración were major opponents of the regime. From the second half of the 1900s, the PLM radicalized taking a more combative discourse and creating an internal tension within the party, which removed the less radical elements. The PLM did not compete in elections and served only as a space for the political and horizontal articulation of the libertarian revolutionaries of the time. Without objectives of taking the state and establishing a dictatorship, to put an end to the DS government establishing libertarian communism in turn. The PLM became clandestine and organized more than 40 armed resistance groups throughout Mexico, and also had indigenous members known for their struggle for community rights and against capitalist property. After the radicalization, Francisco Madero disagreed that peaceful means to take Diaz's power would be exhausted. The electoral fraud of 1910, led by Diaz, would initiate the explosion of the Mexican Revolution. With the arrest of Madero, his opponent in the elections managed to get himself re-elected. Exiled in San Antonio, Texas, Madero drew up the San Luis Plan, calling for an armed uprising, besides declaring null the 1910 elections rejecting the election of Diaz and instituting himself as provisional president. Many rebels responded to the revolutionary call, among them Emiliano Zapata, who played an important role in the organization of the indigenous people of the Morelos region, and Pancho Villa, a former cattle thief and bank robber, long recognized by the humble of the Durango and Chihuahua regions. They were united in an anti-reelectionist front, which gave each group a relative degree of autonomy and independence. In 1911, in the midst of the revolution and with the support of the North American Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, Union, the anarchists with Magon at the fore occupied the region of Lower California taking important cities like Mexicali, At the end of January, they constituted the Socialist Republic of Lower California, the first socialist republic in the world. The Magonistas also had victories in cities such as Nuevo Leon, Chihuahua, Sonora, Guadalupe, and Casas Grandes, spaces that would be lost after the repression occasioned by the Madero government. The revolts organized by Zapata in Morelos and the Ayala plan constituted themselves as instruments of the peasant struggle for the revolution, always inspired by the slogan, Land and Freedom, first sung by Praxedes Guerrero and spread by the Magonistas. Fruit of this important relationship between Zapatistas and Magonistas was Zapata's invitation for Magón to bring Regeneración to Morelos. After that, Mexico sank into a period of civil war and tried to establish a convention at the end of 1914. The events that took place in sequence, like the attempted taking of Mexico City by Villa and Zapata, the convening of the Constituent Assembly by Carranza, who would later be elected president and then be assassinated, 
and the conflicts that followed in the country eventually ended up forming the backdrop of the decline of the revolutionary period in the country. Another important historic reference to Especifismo is the anarchist participation in the Russian Revolution. In early 1917, several regiments mutinied in St. Petersburg. A provisional government arose, acclaimed by Parliament, and the Soviets of 1905 were reborn. The slogan, All Power to the Soviets, was evident. In the field in southern Ukraine, the peasants of Gul Gulai Poli, a village that since the 1905 revolution had had strong anarchist organization, founded the Peasants' Union, which decided to fight for the social revolution independent of the government, seeking self-management of the means of production. In Petrograd, it claimed workers' control in the factories, and Kronstadt sailors, carrying red and black flags, marched on the city with the goal of instituting a Soviet and self-managed republic. In October, anarchist and Bolshevik soldiers acting in concert were able to take the Winter Palace. Then came a divide between the authoritarian and libertarian revolutionary elements. The former were seizing the state apparatus, the, the former were for seizing the state apparatus and moving towards the dictatorship of the Bolshevik party, directed by an all-powerful central committee the latter for libertarian and self-managed communism in the form of councils of Soviets, of workers, peasants, and the people in arms. Progressively, the Bolsheviks began to deny, suppress, impede, and finally prohibit the spread of libertarian ideas and practices. As early as 1918, the, Bolshevik positioned, the Bolsheviks positioned themselves against the workers' control of factories, encouraging the blind discipline of workers to the party, and were gradually consolidating the prohibition of opposition to the party. They militarized labor, expelled elected leaders from the Soviets, forced these, so these the Soviets, to submit to the central power of the party, and prohibited strikes. In the struggle against the White Army, the insurrectionary army of Makhno in the Ukraine allied with the Bolsheviks more than once. On defeating the white threat, the Maknovist army was attacked and persecuted by the Red Army, forcing the survivors to take refuge in other countries. It was the end of the process of self-managed socialization in the Ukraine, repressively reversed by the Bolsheviks in favor of statist and totalitarian forms of organization and social control under a new ruling class. The Kronstadt sailors who demanded that the delegates to the Soviets go back to being chosen by election, freedom for anarchists and other leftist groups, that unions and peasant organizations return to being united, the release of political prisoners, the abolition of political officers, and the same food for all were killed by the Bolsheviks. Despite this proletarian and libertarian revolution having been usurped and dominated by the Bolsheviks, as from their seizure of the state apparatus, the anarchists sinned by omission on the matter of organization. This reflection was formalized years later by Russian immigrants who were in Europe in a document called the Organizational Platform of Libertarian Communists. Makhno, Arshinov, and, other, and others formalized in this document their considerations on anarchist organization, informed by the experiences of the Russian Revolution. This document brought forward important, important insights about the importance of the involvement of anarchists in the class struggle, the need for a violent social revolution that overthrows capitalism and the state, and that establishes libertarian communism. There's also an important contribution on the question of the transition from capitalism to libertarian communism and the defense of the revolution. The platform advocates an anarchist organization at the political level that acts in the midst of social movements, a social level, and emphasizes the role of active minority of the anarchist organization. Moreover, it makes important contributions on the model of organization of the political level of the anarchists, 
For these reasons, it is an important document and has considerable influence in a specifisma. However, we do not believe that a specifismo is the same thing as platformism. As we have been trying to show throughout this text, for us, a specifismo is much broader than platformism and has its theoretical basis in the organizational conceptions of Bakunin and Malatesta. For us, the platform both draws from these authors and brings new contributions and should therefore be considered as a contribution to a specifismo but not the most important contribution. Another factor to be taken into account is that the platform was written about an experience of the military action of anarchists in the midst of a revolutionary process and should not be removed from this context. We understand that this form of organization as expressed in the platform should not be applied in, its, in all its details in non-revolutionary situations. It is more a contribution to the discussion of anarchist military action than a document to discuss anarchist organization in all different contexts. As with the Russian Revolution, we also consider the Spanish Revolution of 1936 a reference. During those years, a social revolution was effectively carried out, a revolution under fire that wanted to reach all sectors from unjust economic structures to the daily life of the population, from the, decrepit not, from the decrepit notions of hierarchy to the historic inequalities between men and women, and all this was the work of the anarchists. The influences of anarchism were brought, by, brought to Spain by Giuseppe Finelli, alliancist and militant very close to Bakunin. Founded in 1910, the National Confederation of Labor, Confederación Nacional de Trabajo, CNT, was the greatest expression of anarcho-syndicalism in Spain and lived under the 1920s, lived until the 1920s between moments of ebb and flow with constant repression of which it was victim. Founded in 1927, the Iberian Anarchist Federation Federación Anarquista Ibérica, FAI, was a clandestine organization dedicated to revolutionary activity which, among its objectives, sought to oppose the reformist currents in the CNT. The action achieved success and the revolutionary anarchists obtained hegemony in the CNT. In 1936, the Popular Front, bringing together the parties of the left, was able to win at the polls. The anarchists of the CNT ended up tactically supporting the front because this would mean the release of imprisoned comrades. With the endorsement of the CNT, the victory of the Popular Front was made possible. However, the fascists did not accept the defeat. On July 18, 1936, the phalangist coup movement breaks out among which Francisco Franco stood out. Thus began the revolutionary explosion that would throw the country into three years of civil war. In the first phase, July 1936 to early 1937, the anarchists were among the most prominent groups. The action of militants in areas such as Catalonia was exemplary. The Republican structures turned into popular organizations in an intense and successful process of collectivization. Factories were occupied and immediate social measures put into practice, such as equal pay between men and women, free medical service, permanent salary in case of sickness, reduced working hours, and increased pay. Metallurgical, timber industry, transport, food, health, media, and entertainment services and rural properties were collectivized. In order to combat the fascist forces, they set up militias that advanced on some fronts, especially the column headed by Buenaventura Duruti. In the second phase, 1937 to 1939, the progress of the counter-revolution was devastating. The phalangists had massive support from Hitler and Mussolini. The resistance was poorly armed and outnumbered. 
the international brigades formed to halt the Nazi fascist advance, had few fighters. Furthermore, there was no help from the liberal nations, France and England, which once again washed their hands. The support from the USSR proved to be a true Greek gift. Within the struggle against fascism, a parallel hunt promoted by the Stalinists for the anarchists and unorthodox labor party of Marxist unification was taking place. The advances made by the CNT FAI were destroyed by those who sought to reestablish the foundations of the state, moderate sectors of the Republic, communists, and socialists. The communists began to gain key positions in the government. The anarchists had to give in once more to unfavorable circumstances. Some members of the CNT ended up participating in the government. In Brazil, we can say that since the Especifista current was not in fact realized in its fullness, our ideological references relate to some initiatives of the past and others we think signatories of the same current in the country's more recent history. We understand that from the earliest years of the 20th century, anarchists linked to organizationalism, in particular followers of Malatesta, struggled to organize a possible number of comrades with a view to forming an organization with common strategies and tactics, based on tactical agreements and clear group understanding. It was these who were responsible for conducting the first Congress of Brazilian Workers in 1906, through the initiatives of the most breathtaking of the national anarchism. These anarchists prepared the conditions that allowed for the full insertion of anarchists in the unions and, social, and in social life, with the formation of schools and theater groups, besides a reasonable written production. It was also, to a large extent, the organizationalist current that eventually helped in the preparation of the anarchist insurrection of 1918 the creation of the Anarchist Alliance of Rio de Janeiro, in the formation of the Brazilian Communist Party, libertarian in feature, and in the events that distinguished the anarchists from the Bolsheviks in the 1920s. In this first phase, the names of Nino Vasco, José Oitisica, Domingo Passos, Juan Pérez Busas, Astrojildo Pereira, until 1920, and Fabio Luz stand out. Later, after social anarchism had been in slumber for almost two decades, part of the organizationalist tradition resurfaced in the journal Asao Directa, Direct Action, and then with the consummation of the 1964 military coup, we again lose our main force in this camp. Repressed, represented by Ideal Perez, and the students of the Libertarian Student Movement, Movimiento Estudiantil Libertario, M-A-L, M-E-L. Finally, another Latin influence on Especifismo that we advocate is the Uruguayan Anarchist Federation, Federación Anarquista Uruguaya, F-A-U formed in 1956 of class struggle and anarcho-syndicalist influences of the organizational models of Bakunin and Malatesta and of the expropriator anarchism from the Prata River region. Seeking to develop an anarchism that confronts Latino problems, the FAO has since its creation performed work in various fronts. It participated in the trade union activities of the National Convention of Workers. CNT, which had a non-bureaucratic model with internal democracy and class struggle tendencies. Direct action associations were established within the so-called combative tendency. With its illegality being enacted in 1967, the foul went underground. Even during this period of clandestinity, with a lot of repression and the arrest of militants, the FAO managed to maintain their union activity in the CNT, in the student movement, and in the struggle against the collaborationism of the Communist Party. It, are, it circulated its publication, Cartas de la FAO, Letters from the FAO, 
1968, Workers' Student Resistance was founded, a mass organization body which adopted a confrontational strategy with factory occupations, with student participation, and trade unionists in student demonstrations. At the end of the 1960s, parallel to the mass organization, the FAO developed the organization of its armed wing, the People's Revolutionary Organization, 33, Organización Popular Revolucionario 33, OPR 33, which realized a series of sabotage actions, economic expropriations, kidnappings of politicians and or bosses, particularly hated by the people, armed support for strikes and workplace occupations, etc. The FAO abandoned focalism as a paradigm of armed struggle, avoiding militarization while possessing social insertion in the population. With the dictatorship of 1973, the FAO directed its efforts towards a general strike that paralyzed the country for nearly a month. It carried out clandestine work and had several militants arrested tortured, and killed. With the political opening, it re-articulated itself and developed its work on the Especifista model, which we advocate today, with three fronts of insertion, union, student, and community. In short, our conception of the historical references of Especifismo is not dogmatic. We have broad ideas that start with the ideas of Bakunin and the alliancists in the IWA, go through the conceptions of Malatesta and his practical experiences at the social and political levels, as well as the experiences of Magón and the PLM in the Mexican Revolution. We are also influenced by the experiences of the anarchists in the Russian Revolution, with emphasis on the Magnavists in the Ukraine, and the organizational references made by the Russians in exile, as, we all, as well as the experiences of the anarchists in the Spanish Revolution around the CNT FAI. In Brazil, we have influences from anarchist organizationalism, highlighting the experiences of the 1918 Anarchist Alliance of Rio de Janeiro and the 1919 Libertarian Communist Party. Finally, the influences of the FAO, both in their struggle against the dictatorship as in their activity in fronts with unions, community, and student movements. This whole set of conceptions and experiences contributes today to our conception of Especifismo. Currently, Especifismo is advocated by various Latin American organizations and developed in practice, even if not by this name, in other parts of the world.